Thank you very much. It's my honor, my privilege to be here. Not only because it was only day before yesterday that I received the fourth in the series of legal notices that served on me after this book was published. There are some copies of the book, uh, and since I'm the publisher uh, and the author, uh, I have some more copies in the file. And if you want more, I can tell you how you can get it quite easily. Uh, I regret my, the absence of my co author, Jyoti Roy Chaudhary. Uh, he was supposed to be here with me, but he had some other work to do, and as a result of which he's not here. So let me apologize on his behalf. The subject that has been given to me is a, <coughs> a, a very broad, all <coughs> all encompassing subject. So maybe I'll speak to you for about 20 minutes or a little longer. I'd be happy to answer questions. Maybe that would make this uh, interaction uh, more meaningful for some of you. Uh, I have been working on this book on and off for the last four and a half years. and. Uh, in March this year, I decided to terminate an agreement that I had with uh, a reputed publisher. The editor of that uh, publishing company, uh, no hesitation naming them, Harper Collins, <coughs> the editor uh, suggested that I cut the book down to half its present size and told me that if uh, I did that, uh, they could bring it out by me. So, uh, he said, thank you, but no thank you. I don't want to have uh, a regret, which I have. So bear with me till the day I'm on. So I said, uh, I returned the advance, and you'll find another to accept that advance, and uh, we parted ways, and so the book came out uh, in early April. We had a formal launch on the 15th of April, and uh, very honestly, I've been overwhelmed by the response I've got large numbers of people who purchased copies, who downloaded it. Uh, and, but I'm also uh, aware that large sections of the mainstream media have uh, referred to ignore its publication altogether. I uh, am, in a strange way, also grateful to the Ambani's, both brothers, because when they served the legal notice on me and my co-authors, as well as the, the distributors of the book, the printers of the book, as well as others, and I'll tell you more about it as we go on. Uh, it, a lot of people became aware of this. And, uh, I would like to believe that, uh, to some extent, uh, India's richest man, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, his younger brother, Arun Ambani, uh, had actually, by serving these legal notices on me, contributed to increasing the sales of the book. But I'm sure they would have from perception, because they think uh, some of the words, some of, some of what has been written in the book is criminally defamatory. You know, they've actually not used the word criminally defamatory, they say defamatory. I suppose when you say defamatory, it's also criminally defamatory. I suppose that's what they mean, but they haven't specified it in using this word in the legal notices that were served on But before I come to that, I'll just try and summarize the, the contents of the book. And uh, it's difficult to summarize a book that runs into 400 pages as with another 200 pages of annexures in a brief kind of a talk or a lecture. And I'll try to situate the, the issue of crony capitalism and uh, utilization and pricing of natural resources in a bigger context, in a bigger global as well as a national context. If you look at it across the world, in many parts of the developing world, especially countries in the southern hemisphere, you have uh, a phenomenon which is sometimes described as a resource curse. This was a term that was first used by an American economist called Richard Orty in the context of mining. And it, it indicates how uh, the presence of natural resources, instead of helping local populations, including indigenous communities, actually contribute to their further 
immiseralization, their exploitation, and in fact a deterioration in their, in their lifestyle, lifestyles, and in their economic and living conditions. And uh, there are a number of people who've talked about this resource curse, but th this uh, phrase uh, is being kind of confined to developing countries. When it, you talk about a developed country, there are different phrases of the news. It's called the Dutch disease. The Dutch disease was supposed to be a disease that inflicted a section of the people of Netherlands after a substantial oil and gas was uh, discovered in the oil sea, in the North Sea. And that increased incomes uh, and a lot of money flew into the exchequer in a very short period of time. Uh, and apparently, much of that money was spent rather quickly. So it's sometimes compared, you know, you know, a, a farmer in Haryana sells his plot of land to a big developer, and he's suddenly sitting on more money than he ever thought he would do. And then, because he hasn't been prudent in using that money, he sort of wastes it all, and he's after some years he's uh, not as well off as he could have been or should have been. But when you look at developing countries, you are dealing here with resources that are uh, natural. Uh, therefore, to some extent, they are not, not to some extent, they are indeed non-renewable. So the best way to utilize this becomes very important. People like Joseph Stiglitz and others, when they talk about natural, with the resource curse, they often take extreme examples, like the extreme example of Sierra Leone or Liberia, where the presence of diamonds, the blood diamonds, has actually led to military coups, changes in government, large numbers of people being killed, wars, and, and conflict on, on, on a very large scale. The, the former head of state of Liberia, Charles Taylor, he is supposed to have uh, given a big uh, ball, shining ball to Naomi Campbell, a very famous model. Subsequently, of course, he was indicted by the International Court of Justice at the Hague. So, I mean, there have been a number of instances uh, across the world, in different parts of the world, that, where you saw the presence of these natural resources, Mother Nature's resources become a curse, not a blessing. And then you see it across the world, and you also see it in uh, Latin America, in different countries of Asia, in Africa, and certainly in India as well. The degrees have differed and the degrees vary. When you come specifically to India, <clears throat> and you look at the fact that the so-called Red Corridor, which is often described as a huge swath of territory in India, about more than a fourth of this country, uh, almost a third of the geographical area of the country, to use a oft-repeated cliche, you know, you have to sort of move from Pashupati, the Pashupati temple in the Himalayas, to Tirupati, not very really far from the of Bengal, and you see a huge area which happens to be the most mineral-rich part of India. It also happens to be the part of India which is most biodiverse. In terms of flora and fauna, it's also the richest part of India. And it's also the, that part of India where some of the poorest of the poor live, the, the scheduled tribes in particular. And you also see this is the same area where left-wing extremism is at its peak. If you merely go by even the statistics that are put out by the government of India and its Ministry of Home Affairs. So, uh, it's not, it's not coincidental that the richest lands also have some of the poorest people. But when you look at the manner in which, say, coal has been exploited, the manner in which iron ore has been, or, or bauxite or manganese, uh, they do fall somewhat into a similar kind of a pattern. In the case of natural gas, it's a little different. And this particular case is different because you're talking about offshore. <coughs> We are talking about uh, reserves of gas which were found deep under the ocean, in the Bay of Bengal. I had the opportunity to actually go there and see it for myself. And for me, it was uh, uh, once in a lifetime kind of an experience to actually go, in, go into the, the Bay of Bengal, uh, 20, 30 kilometers into the, the ocean, and, and I've tried to describe it in one of the opening sections of the book. Now, a few decades ago, natural gas was not utilized. It was actually flared, like the picture of the Congo. It was considered to be almost like a byproduct that was released. It was flared and thrown away. But over the years, as technology has developed, and as uh, crude oil became increasingly scarce and uh, increasingly expensive,
expensive uh, technology to utilize natural gas is very, very important. And currently, <coughs> natural gas does uh, meet uh, something in the region of about 10% uh, of India's total requirements of energy, and, and a higher proportion of the feedstock that is used to manufacture fertilizers, urea <coughs> and ammonia in particular. So as a natural resource, it's very, very important. What do we see? The, the way it works is the natural resources belong to the people. The government is supposed to act as a representative of the people. The government is therefore holds in custody, in trusteeship, the, uh, the resources. And the government is supposed to ensure that the benefits of these natural resources accrue to the larger city. The problem arises when in the regulatory and administrative functions, the government fails to be a true impartial arbiter, a transparent allocator, valuer of these natural resources. And when that happens, uh, a privileged few get benefited and to the detriment of large numbers of people in the manner in which these natural resources are allo allotted, allocated, priced, valued, and we can talk about price and value differently. And therefore, at the end of the day, it's a loss not only to the exchequer, it's a loss to the people. So that's uh, in brief. Now you can argue that in this country, in a large number of cases, you don't have adequate regulatory mechanisms or non-existent. In the case of, uh, say, the Petroleum and Natural Gas Regulatory Board, it's a body with <coughs> negligible powers. Here you have another regulatory body called the Directorate General of Hydrocarbons, which is really a part of the Ministry of Nat uh, uh, Petroleum and Natural Gas. So it doesn't actually have an arm's length distance. So when you have the kind of cronyism and the kind of way in which these natural resources get misappropriated or are misallocated or mispriced, it typically happens because there is a nexus between sections within the government, including political leaders bureaucrats and the beneficiaries, in this case big business houses, uh, including the, the company which is the, the most, uh, the biggest uh, corporate conglomerate in India's private sector, which is the Reliance Industries Limited, headed by its chairman and managing director, Mukesh Rewai Kamani. So what this book tries to do is look at the issue of project capitalism and the issue of utilization of natural resources <coughs> using this as a case, uh, like a, a case study, if you like. Except that this case study has many, many dimensions and many, many aspects. And these have spanned over a period of time, and well over a decade and a half. If you actually look at the rise of Dubai on Bali, uh, and, and the way his two sons fought with each other, to me, uh, I sort of, the, the first four chapters of the book really deal with how the brothers fought with each other. Now, it, there, there were a variety of reasons why the two brothers didn't get along with each other. And one of them could be that Tina and Nita didn't get along. But, but I, I think the more substantive reason, and that possibly the most important reason why the brothers fell out with each other was on controlling access to and pricing natural gas. Essentially, a company set up by the younger brother, Anil, Anil, the Anil Amani group, wanted this gas to travel more than 2,000 kilometers from the Krishna Basin all the way to a place near Delhi called Dhatri, where there was a plan to set up India's largest, Asia's largest, and one of the world's largest gas-based farms. It was also presumed that because Reliance Industries Limited had agreed uh, after a, a global tender was floated by the public sector National Thermal Power Corporation to supply this gas at a price of 2.34 US dollars per unit, which is a million British thermal units. And that price would remain for a 17 year, 17 year. It's a, another story that subsequently Reliance and NTPC fell out and, and that case is still pending, it hasn't been resolved. 
But the point is, NDBC had floated a global tender. Reliance had won that on the basis of that tender that it would supply a contracted amount of gas at that price for 17 years. The younger brother presumed that he could get gas at the same price. But that's where the fight began. And that's where the brothers parted place. And eventually the Supreme Court of India in March 2010 talked about, I mean, said that look, these resources to, to, to uh, private individuals or privately controlled or privately owned corporate entities, they actually belong to the people of the country. Therefore, the government cannot advocate its own right or its responsibilities in, in ensuring that uh, the, the same, the, the, the natural gas is allotted and priced in a manner in which it benefits the, the, the people of this country. So this was where, in May 2010, the Supreme Court ruled. And in fact, of the three judges, I mean, the bench was headed by the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Balakrishnan, but one of the three judges, it wasn't really a dissenting judgment, but uh, there were some parts on which uh, uh, Justice Sudarshan Reddy came out with some amazing kind of uh, comments and uh, they're, they're given in the book. Uh, maybe I should read out something. You, know, you don't think it's really a, a judge of the Supreme Court making the kind of comment. You probably think it was Che Guevara or he was some sort of a uh, revolutionary leader from Latin America. I'll just take a look. So uh, if you can just bear with me for half a minute by the eyes of located that particular uh, extract. I mean, it, it surprised me uh, that a judge of the Supreme Court would use the kind of language that earlier you would presume that sort of power-breathing Marxists would use. But uh, uh, that's what happened. Uh, so I, I just... Uh, This is Justice Reddy. A small proportion of our population over the past two decades has been chanting incessantly for increased privatization of the material resources of the community. And some of them even doubt whether the goals of equality and social justice are capable of being addressed directly. They argue that economic growth will eventually trickle down and lift everyone up. For those at the bottom of the economic and social pyramid, uh, it appears that the nation has forsaken those goals as unattainable at best and unworthy at worst. The new liberal agenda has increasingly eviscerated the state of stature and power, bringing vast benefits to a few, modest benefits for some, while leaving everybody else, the majority, behind. Then he goes on to say, we have heard a lot about free markets and freedom to market. We must confess that we were perplexed by the extent to which it was pressed that contractual arrangements between private parties with the state and amongst themselves could displace the obligations of the state to the people. Then he goes on to say some amazing things. He said, history has repeatedly shown that a culture of uncontained greed, along with uncontrolled markets, leads to disasters. Historically all, and all across the globe, Predatory, predatory forms of capitalism seem to organize themselves first and foremost around the extractive industries that seek to exploit the vast but exhaustible natural resources, water, forests, minerals and oil. They are all being privatized and not being satisfied. The voices that speak for predatory capitalism seek more. You, you people are familiar with laws and judgments. I was, I started going through that voluminous report and came across these lines. I was truly amazed that the judge of the Supreme Court comes to that language that he would use uh, leftist demagogues to use. But be that as it may. The older brother lost the battle. But what happened before the battle was very interesting. The younger brother went to town. He, I mean, very rarely in India do you have an industrialist 
naming a union minister, cabinet minister, and accusing him of virtually cheating. And it was in newspaper advertisement, every paper had it, everything was in the public domain. Finally, the brothers patched up, or ostensibly patched up, or suddenly they stopped, stopped fighting with each other in public. And you thought that, okay, here was the end of the story. But it wasn't. Because after that, what came was a very damning report of the controller and auditor general. We all know that the government is not a monolithic kind of entity. There is the government, and there is the government, there is the bureaucracy, there is the government, there is the bureaucracy. So here was a, a body uh, which is uh, a constitutional authority mandated to oversee public finances. Came up with a scathing report. How the manner in which the production sharing contract was structured was detrimental to the interests of the people of this country. The, the, the uh, exchequer and the people. And one of the things they pointed out was that they called something like an investment multiple. It was almost that the more you spend on capital equipment, the less the government got. And, and there was an implicit kind of a, a situation where the more you spend on capital equipment, the uh, the less the government had got, and, and the, the people who spent would not actually stand to lose. I mean, to put it somewhat crudely, you're serving water to somebody, right? You can serve that water in a, in a paper glass, in a plastic bottle, in a glass glass, or you can have a gold plate. Said here is Maharaja Akin. It's gold plate. So, there was a perverse incentive to spend more on capital. I mean, it's not me. I'm not saying this. It's the CAG is saying this. The other thing that happened was also the numerous instances you pointed out where uh, norms of open competitive bidding, transparent ways of sourcing equipment were just not followed. And, and of course, the company had a different point of view. Uh, and they naturally said this is not correct. But if there was anybody who was indicted more by the CAG report, it was not so much the Ambani's or Reliance Industries Limited and its partner, which is uh, NIKO, NICO Resources of Canada, and now they have another partner, which is British Petroleum. It was the government, the Ministry of Petroleum and Naturalists, the regulatory body called the, the, the Director General of uh, Hydrocarbons. So, so the, the second part of the book is deals with all, all the debates that came up following the publication of the report of the Controller and Auditor General of India. And it's interesting, unlike in the case of the uh, second generation Spectrum case or the Colgate case, where huge amounts of notional losses were mentioned, the CAG didn't uh, put a number as to what were the losses to the exchequer to the government. It was much later that uh, at the internal government report of the uh, note that was prepared for the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, it actually quantified the amount and said the uh, benefit, the notional benefit that would accrue to the Alliance industry would be in the region of 54,000 crores. That was much later. Uh, so the, the, the second part of the book talks about this, and it also talks about, it contains the last interview that a former head of the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, uh, ONGC, uh, Mr. Subir Rama, he gave. It was the last interview before he died. And uh, I knew he was suffering from cancer, lung cancer. He smoked cigarettes, very unusual for a person who's been in an industry which is dealing with inflammable substances all his life. The heavy smoker. He passed away. Uh, but in that interview, he talked a lot about issues like what are contractual obligations. He gave an instance of uh, India's imports of uh, liquefied natural gas from Qatar. And he said, that, look, we had an agreement with this Qatar company. And what happened is after that agreement was signed, the prices shut up. Now he said, once you have signed that agreement, Qatar lost money, but they don't didn't have a choice because you had committed to supply a certain quantity of gas on a certain period of time at a certain price. And, to, and it lived up to its contractual obligations. And he talked about how the whole uh, 
RIL, NTPC, and, and the, the fight between the brothers was essentially about not wanting to fulfill the obligations in a contract in letter and in spirit. He also talked about, as was mentioned, uh, about uh, the younger brother finding interesting documents in the uh, former ONGC's home inside a rust and steel trunk. Uh, Mr. Subira also talked about the first time that how he became chairman and managing director. He asked for records and found these records were missing. Pertaining to a certain period. In this second section of the book, there's also another part which talks about how a former <laughs> petroleum minister, Manishal Garayar, who was removed from his position uh, uh, and replaced by Muli Deora, how after he ceased to be petroleum minister, he had delivered a public, uh, he had delivered a lecture. It wasn't a public lecture, it was a closed door lecture. It was a lecture uh, delivered to a select audience behind closed doors and it was under what is called Chatham House Rules, which says that everything is being said is off the record. I've always wondered how you can have something off the record when you're speaking to 50 people or 40 people. But th those are the chapter of house shows. But what was very interesting is that Mr. Manishan Karaya, he took on his own government because he was very much a minister in the government. He was holding Panchati Raj, uh, youth, sport affairs, northeast, among other things. So he went to the extent of suggesting that when the empowered group of ministers headed by Pranav Mukherjee, who was the then external affairs minister, increased the administered price of gas from $2.34 and today to 4.20. He said that very significant because he said 420 in India, that's a very big significant number. No, I didn't say it. He said, he said it's saying this about his own successor uh, as uh, petroleum minister. All right. Uh, the next part of the book talks about uh, one aspect which has hardly been covered in the media, that these, these debates, CAG's report, much of this has finds place in various newspapers, magazines, websites. But there's one aspect which has not been given, in my opinion, adequate coverage. You know, when you extract gas uh, from under the sea, uh, the ocean, it can lead to subsidence of land in, in the area. And uh, the place where much of this gas is being ex uh, extracted are uh, on the Krishna Godavari Basin in, uh, the, uh, in the southeastern shores of this country in the Bay of Bengal, also happens to be an area which is one of the most fertile parts of this country. It's often described as the rice bowl of India. So uh, that is uh, a chapter which is also a section. And the last part of the book, is talking about the nexus between business and politics. The circumstances which led to Mr. Manish Ankaraya leaving his post, the, the circumstances which led to uh, Mr. Murli Deora being replaced by Mr. Jeffal Reddy, and the circumstances under which Mr. Jeffal Reddy, I use a colorful phrase which is now the Khaitan and Company thinks is defamatory. I said he was kicked upstairs because he was being Minister of Science and Technology. But I do believe, and I'm not the first person, or the only person to have made this remark, that it had something to do with the fact that during his tenure as Petroleum Minister, a uh, penalty of $1.8 billion uh, was imposed on Reliance. The argument was that the reason why what they had originally projected as the, the amount of gas that would come out from that particular block in the Krishnagodavi Basin, the actual amount was less than one fourth. At the time when it was hailed as India's biggest gas discovery and the prices of the company's shares shot up, uh, that, that was one estimate. And what finally happened uh, was that production came crashing down to less than a fourth of what was originally envisaged. Although by then the company had spent, doubled its capital expenditure by more than 80%, almost, uh, uh, I mean, not doubled, almost doubled its capital expenditure. Uh, the, the issue was, really that did the company deliberately suppress production? Reliance says no. These were due to geological complexities. That this whole oil and, oil and gas business is the riskiest business anywhere. Uh, that is, they call it a casino business. Uh, I was 
farmers also think that their profession is the riskiest profession. Uh, you know, what is technologically most challenging? Those who want to send their a spacecraft to Mars think theirs is the most uh, technologically challenging. So these are matters of perception. Be that as it may. The point is that the dispute, which is right now uh, being, there's arbitration proceedings currently uh, happening. Uh, I have no idea when it will conclude. But the question is whether Reliance Industries Limited and its partners, NICO Resources and British Petroleum, deliberately suppress production. Because there is one view, and this is the view of experts, that they were supposed to drill a certain number of wells, which they did not. They have their explanation as to why they didn't. But this is the area of contention, this is the area of controversy. The other area of contention is, as for the terms of their production sharing contract, after they completed exploring a particular area, uh, and if they haven't been able to find gas, they're supposed to relinquish that property. In the case of uh, Reliance Industries Limited, it was found that they hadn't relinqu relinquished about 90% of the area that was supposed to be relinquished. The whole idea is that if you cannot find it, then the government or the ministry should have the right to auction the again to somebody else, if somebody else is willing to take up that property. It's very interesting that even as we are talking, if you read today's Times of India and Business Standard, and uh, today the Press Trust of India has put out, there's been yet another report of the Controller and Auditor General, which have repeated all the allegations of the earlier report has put in. It's out. Uh, I really don't know when it will become a public document and will be presented in Parliament. Uh, it's also very, very interesting that uh, a judge of the Supreme Court has appointed a, a third arbitrator. He's an Australian gentleman. The two former chief justices of India, and it took two years to appoint the third uh, arbitrator to decide on this whole issue. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, on the day before the election results were declared on the 16th of May, ONGC moved the Delhi High Court, saying that Reliance was stealing its gas because they have the contract to explore or the rights to explore a particular area which adjoins the area which Reliance. And what is possibly unique, and if you read the Indian Express with all the details uh, of the last few days, it appeared in the Indian Express, day before yesterday in the business page. The allegation is not only that RIS has stolen our gas, the allegation is that the government of India did nothing about it. That the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, as well as the Director of Hydrocarbon, did nothing about it. So it's very interesting that here's a public sector company which is owned or largely owned by the government of India, making this allegation against its own shoulder. And it's interesting that Mr. Moili, uh, the day before election results were announced, he's the, the outgoing, uh, uh, he's the former Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas, actually questioned his own secretary and said, how have they done this? How can they do this? How can ONGC go to court without us taking our permission? Because I, the minister, you, the secretary, you are representing the government of India, the government of India is going to be share with and so on and so forth. That's where uh, the, uh, we'll see what the Delhi High Court uh, decides on this case and where it goes. Uh, and uh, as I was mentioning to you on the 16th of April, uh, the day after we had a formal launch function uh, to release the book, Khaitan and company uh, served me on notice saying that I had criminally defamed uh, Reliance Industries Limited. Oh, sorry, again I'm making a mistake. Not criminally defamed, defamed, just defamed uh, Reliance Industries Limited and its chairman and managing director that I tarnished their reputation. And they took some chunks of the book. Uh, then a uh, few days later, I received another legal notice, this time from Mullah and Mullah, on behalf of the younger brother, Anil Dhirubhai Ambani, and the group he heads, Anil Dhirubhai Ambani group, making more or less the same set of allegations. Uh, the allegations were against the authors, the publisher, and I'm the publisher. Those who helped me put the book online, because it's available on Amazon, Kindle, etc., etc. The print, the, those who distributed the book, and interestingly, on Amazon, on Flipkart, those who were making the book available. And what is even more interesting, and uh, this is where 
SLAPP, strategic lawsuits against public participation. So I was, to me, it was just a nice phrase that you had to hear. Chilling effect, I'm not knowing what it's all about. Uh, the legal notice was served on a lady, uh, a, a woman, who is the events manager of a non-government organization called the Foundation for Media Professionals. And uh, her quote-unquote crime was that she had the temerity to forward an email that I sent her, which was like an invitation to the launch function to those who were on their mailing list. I happen to have been uh, a, a former president of the same uh, organization, the Foundation for Media Professionals, and I thought she would do a personal favor to me because she had this science law, and then I wanted people to come for that. I was pleasantly surprised that uh, the hall was jammed back. There was no place to sit. There were people sitting on the aisles. The hall had a capacity of 150. I reckon there were at least 200 people. It was interesting that there was not a single line appear in any of the newspapers thereafter. The panelists included the former cabinet secretary, uh, TSR Subramaniam, former petroleum secretary, TNR Rao, uh, Prashant Kushan, uh, the lawyer, who's also um, one of the founding members. The party, Sucheta Dalal, Mr. Siddharth Brother Rajan was the moderator, the former editor of the Hindu. Uh, uh, though, when the legal notice was served, a oh, lot of the papers they spoke. Some of the, those in the, uh, in the social media, some of them on YouTube, other they did it. Uh, a few days after the second notice came, a third notice came. This was also, um, I'm, on, I'm almost through. The third notice came also from Khaitan and Company. The first one was from Khaitan and Company Delhi, the next one came from Khaitan and Company Mumbai. The new part of it was that I better pay up a hundred crore rupees within ten days, or else they reserve the right to take appropriate action against me. Uh, the first notice also suggested that I pulp every single copy of the book, not print anymore, stop its distribution, and remove all material from the World Wide Web. That's it. The other new part of that second legal notice from Khatan and Company was that I was not only guilty of defaming and lowering the prestige of Mr. Ambani and the Reliance Industries in the eyes of the world at large and Indian society in particular, so was a particular person I had quoted during the launch function. He happened to be one Mr. G.K. Gandhi. The one Mr. G.K. Gandhi happens to be Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi, uh, former governor of the state of West Bengal, uh, former government officer, who that same morning had uh, delivered a public lecture on the occasion of the conclusion of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of the Central Bureau of Investigation. It was a public lecture at Vigyan Bhavan in front of hundreds and hundreds of people. It was broadcast on, on television channels. And in that uh, a, a paragraph <coughs> of that public speech that he delivered, he talked about, you know, we used to talk about a parallel economy, but now we have a parallel state. And he talked about how perhaps nowhere in the world is a company exerting the kind of resources, uh, kind of exerting the kind of influence on the resources of a country in the same way that he named Reliance Industries, he named Reliance, he mentioned Reliance, I think, two or three times, twice at least, in the course of his speech. Uh, he was present, in fact, in the audience, and I did also read out that relevant uh, paragraph. So that was the other bad thing I did. Uh, my lawyer, Sumante, uh, then replied to the legal notice. My justification was essentially that nothing that is in the book is something that is not in the public domain. Every single opinion, fact has been attributed. Not a single fact has been challenged. What has been challenged is my interpretation of my opinion. And I said, I'm not the first newspaper, a first writer. By the way, they don't want to call this a book. They prefer to describe it as a pamphlet. Uh, right through uh, the Italian company, said, the said, the aforesaid pamphlet. So their their version of their uh, their right to describe anything the way they wish to. Uh, so I also said that look, you may disagree with my opinion, but you cannot say that your version is not taken. That would be factually incorrect. So the first point I said, the information that you put out is 
almost entirely in the public domain. Barring these exclusive interviews like Mani Shankar's speech, like uh, Subhi Raha's uh, last interview, barring some portions, almost everything else has been, and it's been attributed. I said, so and so said this in Hindu newspapers, so and so said this in Times of India, so and so has been quoted in uh, Outlook magazine, whatever. So every single bit of information, oh, these are uh, uh, records, this is the CAG's report, this is what uh, is in Parliament, this was what was said in Parliament, this was what has been said in, uh, you know, uh, given in the court, or this was the court of uh, uh, so and so lawyers said this in court. So it was all attributed, every bit of information. But then they said that, look, I spent hours and hours and hours with your representatives. And I've given your version in full. I argue that I've been, quote unquote, more than fair. And in fact, their uh, notes, their, their documents have been included in the, in the appendices, in the annexures. So I said, you can't say that I haven't been fair to you. You may disagree with my proof. Anyway, uh, soon thereafter, the fourth love letter arrived. Uh, that was the fourth. This was the reply to the reply. Where they have now picked up some new sentences. Uh, they said that you've been talking about this in Google Hangout, you've been talking about this on, on Twitter, and you haven't yet destroyed the book, so the book is still available in the marketplace. You haven't removed all the material from the website. So there were three or four sentences that they were very unhappy with. One of them, uh, in one sentence, I described this company as an oligarch. So uh, that has been found to be, or uh, has been interpreted to be defamatory. Uh, another place I've said that the two brothers have been vengeful and greedy. That also they found to be uh, defamatory and in some of these other things. So that's where the position is at present. I do not know if they will take me to a court of law and if so they will. Uh, the interesting part in this is the chilling affair. Uh, Money Life magazine wrote a review of the book. They were served at Eden Bills. Also asked to pay up 100 dollars. Uh, I have become a in certain circles, you know, not exactly untouchable, but people are a little wary of me. Websites and magazines and newspapers that used to publish me are now saying, hold on, hold on. You know, it's a hassle to get An article of mine, which has appeared in the latest issue of the Economic and Political Weekly, which looks at some of the legal disputes that are going on, and some of you may find that interesting, it's, in the, the, it's on the website and it's the current issue of the Economic and Political it was actually rejected by four other people before the EPW was kind enough to publish it and I had to write it in a certain way. Uh, a magazine which did an interview with me uh, pulled it off at the last one. So, chilling thing. So, it's not just that you intimidate or harass or browbeat the writer and go through the same with the rest of it or make people worry. Should I? utter some unpleasant truths. So that's where the situation is. Thank you for patiently listening to me. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much.